Welcome back to my channel guys. Today's video is all about cheat meals, cheat days, refeeds. Do I personally use them and can they provide any positive health benefits for fat loss? So let's get stuck into it. So having these cheat meals or cheat days is a widely used dieting practice amongst people in and out of the fitness industry. And they basically give you permission or justification needed to eat more than you probably should during a weight loss diet. So the old way of thinking behind these refeeds or cheat days is that consuming meals loaded with calories or taking entire days at significantly higher than normal calorie amount will one, improve your total weight loss, two, increase your satiety and appetite regulating hormones, which in turn reduce hunger and help improve our future dietary adherence, and three, somehow they magically boost our metabolism during a weight loss diet. But the problem is many of these claims don't actually have any scientific evidence to support them particularly when it comes to long-term weight loss outcomes. Now, I understand there's definitely a strong desire for us to believe that refeeds or the cheat meals are effective tools for all of the above reasons. Of course, why wouldn't we want to believe it? It gives people an opportunity to eat more calories with the belief that it's going to have a positive effect on weight loss. So for this reason, I think it's really important to point out where some of these ideas have been taken out of context and why in some situations these untracked cheat days may actually be having a greater negative impact than a positive one, particularly in the setting of a diet. So let's take a look at some of the research on hormones. There was a large number of publications that came to life back in the early 1900s. And these alluded to the fact that when we take these periods of eating more calories, specifically carbohydrates, this increases our satiety hormone leptin, which proposedly helps to mitigate feelings of hunger, which we experience while we're dieting. And this might have beneficial effects for long-term dietary adherence. However, what we actually see, and this is where the research has been taken out of context, is that leptin actually returns to its pre-cheat meal levels in a relatively short period of time. And in some cases, this return to baseline occurs within about 24 hours or less. So if the levels aren't actually sustained for the days to follow, then what was the benefit of that cheat meal? At best, you've taken a day's break from the diet or you've added an extra day to achieve your desired weight loss goal. However, this is only the case when energy balance was restored from the cheat meal. What's more likely to happen in the practice of taking these cheat days is that despite the few hours where our leptin levels are restored, and perhaps you do feel less hungry now that you've stuffed your face full with a giant cheeseburger, the extra calories that you've just consumed from that cheat meal have actually completely undone all the work that you've done throughout the earlier parts of the week. And now this person is in the exact same place they were a week ago. And we actually have a really nice graphic in our book, Fat Loss Forever, that depicts this type of dieting behavior and why some people just can't seem to make any progress. We also know that just because you have le leptin in your bloodstream doesn't necessarily make you hungrier, at least not in the short term situation. In fact, I've got a study here that actually looked at serum leptin levels and appetite in people that either consumed breakfast or skipped breakfast. And what they found was that despite the breakfast skippers having lower leptin levels, their appetite scores were not significantly different from people who did eat breakfast. So here's why the argument for acute rises in leptin just doesn't make sense from a mechanistic point of view. Leptin is produced by our fat cells and as such, it makes sense why our circulating leptin levels correspond with our accumulative energy balance and not the acute provision of energy from a delicious greasy hamburger. So in order to restore our leptin levels back to our pre-weight loss values, you'd probably need to restore the entire diet's period of energy deficit and essentially gain back all the body fat that you lost. Mm -mm. Yeah, nah, thanks. New, no, new, no, new. No. Hopefully this helps to explain why refeeds and the acute rises in leptin from eating a handful of carbohydrate rich foods shouldn't be the main focus during weight loss. The rules for fat loss are pretty plain and simple. If you aren't in an energy deficit, you aren't losing body fat. So what about cheat days and their effect on our overall resting metabolic rate? 
is there a possibility outside of this hormone argument that supports the use for refeeds for significantly increasing our resting metabolic rate and having greater rates of fat loss? Well, several studies have looked at the effect of these short-term overfeeding studies and changing to our resting metabolic rate. And these date back as far as 1985. So almost all, with a few minor exceptions, actually report similar findings. One study here found that three days of eating at 40% above maintenance resulted in a total daily increase of 7%, which was found to be significant. Other studies have found that eating at 50% above maintenance resulted in an increase in 54 calorie increase per day in resting metabolic rate. But how significant is that from a practical sense? And what does that mean for fat loss? It likely depends on the individual's endogenous metabolic rate or their maintenance calories. Even for somebody with a small or a low maintenance calorie target, and maybe they're consuming around 1200 calories per day, just as an example, 54 calories is only 4.5% of their total daily energy requirements. So to what effect that actually has on somebody's long-term weight loss? I personally just don't think that it's going to amount to very much. I also want to draw your attention to what I was talking about before. So from a practical perspective, what we typically see with refeeds is that people tend to go overboard on those foods that are extremely calorically dense during that refeed. And then any small increase that we might see in their resting metabolic rate is totally outweighed by the large energy surplus created from that meal. So I do have a quick side rant. I've always found it really interesting when someone starts working with me and they've been told by their coach to avoid certain foods during the week. But on the weekends, oh, it's totally okay to have this untracked day or meal. Like there's something magic about the weekend that makes it totally okay for them to track down whatever they want because they don't count. We do have a number of nutrition researchers who are currently investigating uh, the association between body composition and refeeds, but these are for slightly longer uh, periods than what's previously been examined. So if you would like to learn a little bit more about those, you can go and check out some of those topics on my YouTube channel. So to summarize the implications of refeeds and their effect on resting metabolic rate, it seems like these short-term periods of overfeeding refeeds, whatever you want to call them, they don't seem to have a significant impact on our resting energy expenditure. It's about 100 calories or less per day. So the last point that I'd like to cover today in today's video is about the potential benefits of refeeds and their impact on performance, as well as the psychological advantages or disadvantages. So we often hear that people um, say refeeds help you to train harder uh, because of the extra stored glycogen. So there actually has been quite a lot of discussion uh, about carbohydrate availability and whether it's a rate limiting step uh, for strength trained athletes. And there are some studies that are very tightly controlled, in fact, that look at bodybuilders and how carbohydrate availability actually impacts performance. So earlier studies seem to suggest that carbohydrates make little to no uh, difference in overall performance. But more recently, some studies actually indicate otherwise. So the first study here uh, looks at bodybuilders who performed 15 sets of compound quad exercises and five sets of isolation work. And that resulted in about a 28% decrease in stored glycogen, which is modest, but it's not a crazy amount. And then other studies have also produced similar findings for strength-tained athletes. Now, more recently, a study by Hocken et al. 2020 uh, which analyzed muscle glycogen storage depletion in specific type 2 muscle fibers, which, by the way, are the predominant fiber types used for muscle contraction during resistance training, uh, found a 54% reduction in intramyofibrillar muscle glycogen stores. And that's significantly more than what was previously found. So my speculation and the practical implications of this are that it's possible uh, that for some folks, particularly those who are undergoing a diet phase or when they're just in a negative energy balance, our body is now using a greater percentage of or potentially all of their available glucose. And therefore, it's possible that performance may actually start to decline and that would limit the total amount of work we're able to perform. We know that less accumulated volume may actually lead to greater lean body mass losses throughout the course of a diet which is not optimal for a physique uh, athlete or competitor. 
Is there a performance benefit to having refeeds in this particular setting? I don't feel like I have a clear answer, but hopefully our future research can actually give us clear cut answers. Okay, lastly, let's have a look at the psychological advantages. So a number of athletes have reported that taking these refeed days at either maintenance or even slightly above maintenance has actually helped them with their overall dietary adherence. So it's been reported that taking say either single day or multiple days on higher calories actually gives them a psychological break from the diet and that gives them something to look forward to and kind of fills up their cup for the start of a new week. Based on these subjective findings, it does seem like for some individuals, refeeds probably would be a worthy addition to their diet. But on the contrary, if these strategies cause an individual to be less adherent to their overall nutrition, refeeds probably are not going to be an appropriate option for them. Now, for me personally, these seven day diet breaks uh, were definitely not a good strategy. They made me less compliant to my overall nutrition targets. I'd probably be more inclined now that I've experienced that to do a shorter, more aggressive refeed period so that I didn't feel like I was getting so far away from my normal day to day food and eating routine. So let's go back and summarize everything from today's video. So it seems like refeeds or diet breaks that are three to four days duration do seem to have a robust effect on protecting our lean body mass and attenuating decreases to our resting metabolic rate. However, the optimal diet break length or refeed period is still somewhat unknown. Taking these refeeds can result in acute changes to our appetite regulating hormones like leptin, but it doesn't seem to be any long-term benefits for fat loss. So short-term changes to our basal metabolic rate have been observed uh, with the addition of either a cheat day or refeed, whatever you want to call it. Uh, however, these are relatively small changes and probably under 100 calories per day and are probably going to be outweighed by the calories consumed from a cheat meal or especially in the case of an untracked cheat meal or a full day of untracked eating. The benefits of these refeeds on performance in resistance trained athletes might be beneficial, especially during a diet phase. However, I think more studies are needed to assess the extent of these benefits. But what we do know is that there are a few principles that must be adhered to in order for a refeed or a cheat meal to succeed. An overall energy deficit must be maintained throughout the fat loss phase uh, if weight loss is to occur. And these techniques are only going to be appropriate if a person is able to maintain adherence to their nutrition strategy. Thank you so much for watching guys. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please leave me a comment below and I will see you next time.